أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرجل من الله صدق الله العليم العظيم Our respected elders, brothers, sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. All praise is due to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one, the creator, the cherisher, the sustainer, and our salam, salutations upon the Holy Prophet Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family and his illustrious companions. Qala Rabbi Shrahni, Sadri, wa Yisirni, Amri, wa Hanul Qadatam, Min Nisani, Yafqaw, Mawli. Our khutbah today deals with the concept of freedom within Islam and also very importantly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created humanity, has created insan, everything that exists in the world, jinn, everything has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creations, one of his creations who is insan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us aqab. He has given us what we call in simple terms brains. You know brains? They exist up here. And with that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also given us the freedom to believe in Allah, also the freedom to protect Allah. Simple. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُبِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَقْفُرْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear in the Holy Quran. You want to be a believer? It's your choice. You want to be a disbeliever? is also your choice. And that is why the concept of freedom is something which is very misunderstood within Islam. And we find that there was an article in the Detroit News that is in America and they contrasted the lives of two ordinary people from the Palestinian refugee camps in Jordan. And these are two people that are joined simply by the faith of in believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yet their choices is separated by the choice of lifestyle. And one got up every morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, every day, and he walked a mile. He got up very early to the masjid to be in time for Fajr at the masjid. At that time, the other one was often just getting to sleep. He was capping off his night by being at a nightclub, drinking, socializing at a bar, serving to be a tourist guide to tourists, and he was making a choice of life, and yet he believed in Islam. And when we speak about liberation, especially as Muslims, we speak about liberation of the Muslim Ummah, we speak about choices in life, and we also speak about, very importantly, that we as Muslims, we want the Sharia to be instituted as was probably the constitution of the world and especially our constitution. We need to catch a wake-up call. Because I can safely tell you that 99.9% .9 of Muslims throughout the world are not prepared for the implementation of the Sharia. Simple. Let's not fool around. We want that choice, but are we ready? To accept that choice and in the implementation of the Sharia into our lives. <coughs> and if we look at the, at the Muslim Ummah, the current state of the Muslim Ummah today, it is one big refugee camp. We are robbed, we are wounded, we are tortured, we are expelled, we are dispossessed and we are also disenfranchised. We are enslaved by the Western world. We are now coming to the month of Hajj and we think by going for Hajj, by experiencing Arafah, making Tawaf in Makkah al-Mukarramah, so forth and so on, and performing the rituals of Hajj, we think that that is freedom. That is not freedom at all. That is simply fulfilling the ritualistic sign of Hajj. <coughs> if we look at the actual message of Hajj, the actual message of Hajj is that the Muslim nations of the world are supposed to get together there, look at the problems of the world, 
and together as a collective solve those problems of the world. It's not happening. There are thousands of Syrian refugees throughout the world. Why is it, and ask ourselves the question, why is it that they do not want to immigrate to Muslim countries, but they want to go to countries in Europe and to America, so forth and so on? Why? Because if they go to Muslim countries, they will be put back into slavery. Understand that very clearly. Some of the worst races in the world are the Saudis themselves. You can stay in Saudi Arabia for the next 50 years, but you will remain a foreigner in Saudi Arabia simply because you're not a Saudi. Simple. You go to Jordan, the Palestinian refugees are treated like dirt. You go to Egypt, the same thing. And therefore you find even the Syrian refugees, they're experiencing the same thing. And all the refugees in the world at this point in time, there are over 65 million refugees in the world. And of those 65 million, three quarters of that 65 million are Muslims. There's a definite problem, my dear brothers and sisters. And why is it? We need to tell ourselves, we need to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Simply because it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who grants us freedom. So what is the first stage of freedom? We look at South Africa in the context of our own country. In 1994 we had the first non-racial democratic elections. Peace, you know, unity, preservation and restoration of human dignity. That's what we experienced here in South Africa. And on the 27th of April which is passed, we find it marks the liberation of our country. And it, we were under colonialism and white domination. But what is freedom? The first concept we need to understand is the concept of freedom. It's a distinguishing quality of humanity. Not only of Muslims, of humanity. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, even before the revelation of the Quran, he was a human being. He was studying the history of the Rasul He was part of an organization known as the Hilful Fudul. We formed an organization where they were assisting the poor and the oppressed. So from the very beginning of the life of the Prophet even before the revelation of the Quran, he was there to help people towards their freedom. Freedom refers to a state of being in which an individual is able to make a choice in thought, number one, in behavior or speech, number two, as he or she wishes, or to avoid doing so without violating similar freedom on the part of others. Now, freedom of thought is a very important aspect. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala freedom of thought. He was the Prophet of Allah. He never disallowed any Sahabi even to ask him any question. He wasn't the the Prophet of Allah, you must just listen to me. He never did that. Like some of us would do. You know, I'm the husband in the house, I'm the father, just listen to what I want to tell you to do. I'm the authority. No. <coughs> the Rasul Sallallahu authority was based upon the command of Allah, upon righteousness. And thought is something that none of us can control. No matter who or what we are, be you even Hitler couldn't control the thought of his very own army and his very own people. He ruled with an iron fist through fear, but there were people within his army that thought differently. You even look at Donald Trump. If you look at how he rules his country in an authoritarian manner, there are people within the White House who think differently. The next thing he does, he fires them. That's a long story. We won't touch on that at the moment. Everybody thinks differently. The child that you have born, that your wife has born, is going to think differently to you. For thought has been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the thought has to be based upon the Quran and Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is why the great Hassan al-Banna said, we need to start thinking Islam. 
The mind has to be right. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he conquered Makkah al Mukarramah. He entered Makkah al Mukarramah. And obviously he was, right, he was on, his, on the horse in front, on the camel in front. So Abu Sufyan, who had not yet embraced Islam, he was standing next to Abbas radiallahu ta'ala who was the uncle of the Prophet So he, Abu Sufyan looks at Abbas and says that indeed that this is a great day for the Banu Ashim. Why? Because the Prophet came from the tribe of the Banu Ashim. One of the smaller tribes of the Quraysh. And indeed your people, your tribe must feel good today for Muhammad Sassam conquered Makkah. So Abbas radiallahu ta'ala looked at Abu Sufyan and said to him, You have an intention to embrace Islam, but Islam has still not entered your heart and most importantly your mind. It is not a great day for the Banu Hashim, it is a great day for Islam. Change your thinking and think like a Muslim needs to think. It's very important. We all need to understand that. And therefore when we speak about thought, Thought is something that needs to be based upon the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad That's the first thing we need to teach ourselves and our children. And that's why Hassan al-Banna says, when the mind is Muslim, the heart is Muslim. The personality becomes Muslim. Everything around you becomes Muslim and you start influencing the environment around you. Like the Prophet Muhammad The Rasul was the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, we have been given a freedom of choice. Allah says, We have shown you two paths. And Allah says, We have guided him along the right path when he is thankful or thankless. Says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes it is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever thought about it? That most of us are Muslim here today simply by accident? Sorry to be so blunt. We are all Muslims simply thank Allah for that ni'mah. We were born to Muslim parents. Thank Allah for that. That is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why my dear brothers and sisters, from what I said earlier on, there are three dimensions to freedom. First, freedom has both positive and negative aspects. It includes the freedom to do. In a country like South Africa, some of you might have experienced this problem. When my child and your child reaches the age of 18, they tell you very simply, I'm 18 years old, I can do whatever I want. I'm no more under your hand. We have had so many problems in our society. Girl wants to get married, boy wants to get married, parents not heavy, blah, blah, blah. Long, long stories. They simply tell you and the Imam and the Sheikh can do me nothing. The country gives me my freedom. Simple, my dear brothers and sisters. What we need to teach our children. They are never free of their parents, even until Qiyamah. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one day a man came to the Rasul and complained about his father. The married man, three, four children, had a booming business as we would call it. So the Rasul Sassim summoned the father, said to the father, you know, your son is complaining about you. You know, you just go to his business, take whatever you want to, take some of his money and everything. So the, he said to the Rasul Sassim, he says, yeah, Rasul Sassim. I brought him up, I educated him, I did everything for him. Even his business, I gave him the capital to start with it. Now that he is such a great businessman and boom is all the blessings of Allah, he doesn't look after me. So the Prophet summoned the son and said, Come here, you, your wife, and your children, your business belong to your father. Simple, my dear brothers and sisters. The freedom has both positive and negative aspects. Sometimes we abuse it and sometimes we use it in a positive way. And we need to start using it in a positive way. 
And it is the freedom to do something as well as the freedom not to do it. And the freedom is not to follow the path of shaitan. You know, one day some idiot said to me, you know, shaitan, he has more knowledge than the Prophet Now would be better. I said, are you sick, my dear brothers and sisters? I said, my brother, are you stupid? Shaitan has no power. Shaitan has absolutely no power. He only has power over, over you when you allow to him to have that power over you. That is what Allah says, Allah he was wisufi sudurinas. When he starts whispering in your ear. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, on the day of Qiyamah, you're gonna come, you know, Allah, Shaitan, he whispered in my ear, Shaitan will say, hey, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't know him. I didn't tell him to do it, he did it out of his own. You had the right to choose the right or the wrong, the right or the left. Secondly, everybody needs to understand that there are limits to video freedom such that it cannot impeach upon another person's freedom. You cannot impeach on another person's freedom. Now what is important to understand here is that the restraint that needs to be practiced in our society and need to be taught to children. There are certain choices we don't have. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made something haram, it is haram. If you have made something halal, it is halal. Simple. Like many people will come to me and say to me, you know, Sheikh, for example, you know, uh, this Justin Bieber or something was here. So this lady phones me and says, Sheikh, my daughter wants to go. Can I send her or not send her? I said, why are you asking me? You want me to make the choice. So that when you come to Allah, you know, Imam Abu Wahab said so. Uh -uh. You need to restrain your child from going to that which is haram. <coughs> Say it is haram, finish. Don't beat around the bush. And there is a limit to the freedom of your child. There is a limit even to one's own freedom. Because one's own, that is why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, Ad-dunya sijinul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. He didn't say that this earth, the Rasul Sassan did not say that this earth is a prison. He said that this dunya is a prison for the Muslim, the true believer, and it is a jannah for the kafir. There's a big difference. The earth will always remain the earth. The dunya is what we create here as how we live. What does it mean? You know that little shackles we are in now to enjoy what this earth gives. That's why many people ask me, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives the kafir anything, everything. They have these nice beaches, these holiday places and everything. They're having holidays all the time. They have anything of this earth. Remember that even those Jews and those Zionists also do good. They give charity, they give everything. On the day of Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, I gave you everything of this world for the little good you've done. Now, I am going to be judgmental upon you without any obstacle. It's a beautiful kissa where there was a Muslim and a Christian. They were soldiers that were going to fight. They injured each other and they were lying, they dying in the desert. So the Christian makes a dua and he realizes Allah is Allah. He makes a dua that, you know, I would like some water. So Allah sends a malaika and gives him water. The Muslim makes the dua for water, he gets no water and he dies. He comes up there and he says, Ya Allah, I believed in you. I believed in you, Ya Allah. You gave him water, he didn't give him. He says, you know what? The malaika says, Allah says he did a little bit of good. I rewarded him in this dunya on this earth. Now he's going to be punished by me. You committed a little bit sin. I, I punished you on this earth. I'm going to grant you the death. Simple. Simple, my dear brothers and sisters. And there has to be restraint on individual freedom. Limit. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Many of us say this thing, you know. Uh, you open up the Quran and you say, Allah says this, you know, this is my opinion about what Allah says. Stop that. Stop that. We 
don't have an opinion about what Allah says in the Quran or even about the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah says in the Quran that you have no opinion if Allah and His Rasul has decided about something. You have no right to have an opinion about something if Allah and His Rasul has decided about something. So our, in the, our freedom is limited. Then, my dear brothers and sisters, third, because it is a choice, the individual is then accountable for his or her actions. The consequences deriving from our choices that we make in our life. My dear brothers and sisters, the Quranic concept of freedom is described in many words in the Quran, such as the word which is used as called free, or tahrir to free, Najat, salvation, protection, foes reaching the target, achieving the goal, falah. You know when the Muaddin says, Hay ala falah, most of us say, Ooh, yet that's our real salah. Isn't it so? It's like a difficulty. The only thing that you get for free is what? Do you pay to come to the masjid? Do you pay? Come and tell me, do you pay? No, you don't pay. Whatever you give here on the day of Jumma is out of your own free choice. Simple. When the Bible says, Ayyar al Falah, most of us is a burden. It will take two plugs and put it in the ear. Especially for Fajr, by the way. And Falah means also flowering of the potential of the human being, fulfillment of that latent qualities to achieve nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything that comes to us that has to do with Allah is totally free. To read the Quran is your freedom of choice. To make salah is your freedom of choice. To pay zakah is your freedom of choice. To fast in the month of Ramadan is your freedom of choice. Nobody is standing there with a gun against your head. And yet most of us or many of us don't make that right choice. In Hadith, in the literature of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is reference to the word itq, meaning emancipation and liberation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in the matters of deen, Allah says, La ikraha fit deen, qad tabayyana rujdu min al -ghayr. Let there be no compulsion in deen, truth stands clearly from error, says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason, <laughs> For the enshrinement of the values of the freedom verse is that the two largest tribes of Medina, the Aus and the Khajraj, before Islam made a pledge. If their birth, if their wives gave birth to baby boys, they would become Jews. This was before they embraced Islam. This is how some of the members of those two tribes became Jews. However, when Allah blessed these two tribes with Islam, and the entity Islam, members of these families wanted to the return and forced their children to embrace Islam. <coughs> the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, stopped them and said, No. <laughs> Go to your sons who embrace Judaism, give them the word of Islam, and give them the freedom of choice to embrace Islam or to remain Jews. Understand that very clearly. Islam advocated such a principle. At a time when the Roman Empire used to force people to Christianity or they used to be dead then. The Persian Empire used to burn or torture religious reformers at that time. Within this atmosphere, Islam came to assert the principle of freedom of deen. Very important. It's very, very important for us to understand. It is significant to note that how we express ourselves as Muslims is a reflection of our attitudes. And it is unfortunate that a virtually religious debate or argument over religious matters, etiquette and respect is often absent. I remember a few weeks ago, even in the month of Ramadan, there was a lot of debate. And there was some sister that came onto the you know, on the WhatsApp or whatever, and insulting and, you know, one of the scholars of, of the Muslim community here in Johannesburg or whatever. And the words that were used is disturbing. 
No matter how we disagree with each other, there has to be absolute respect. Respect and our etiquette of debate has to be implemented within our society. No matter how we disagree, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala used to disagree many a times. Don't live in this fool pa fool's paradise that after the Prophet sallallahu the Sahaba lived. Yes, 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 we agree. No. Many a times they disagree. Immediately after the demise of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many of the tribes refused to pay zakah. Said Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala decided as the Khalif, I'm going to make jihad against them. I'm going to force them. He said, we're going to go take the army and force them to give uh, uh, zakat. The other Sahaba disagreed. Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Umar, all of these great Sahabi said to him, how, how can you do it when Muhammad Sassar did not do it? What was his argument? He said, if we don't defend that pillar now, the next pillar to fly is going to be Salah. It was wisdom and hikmah in what he said. They, they, they then understood and he spoke to them and they debated, but the wisdom sunk into their minds and they then supported him. But when they went there, they just didn't go there and said, you know, don't even chop your head, chop your head. No. It's not like oh, we understand Islam. There was one great Sahabi who came to the Prophet He said, Ya Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I was now with a woman. He didn't have sex with her, but he cuddled and he fondled her, or whatever the case may be. He said, I've committed a sin. So the Rasul Sassim was on his way to Salah. He was on his way to Salah. And he said, come with me, let's go make Salah. They made Salah, finished Salah, he comes back to the Rasul Sassim. He says, yeah, Rasul Sassim committed sin. The Rasul Sassim said, what did you just do now? He said, I made Salah. He said, go, Allah has given, forgiven you, God, of will go. Oh, when we do that, we what they look at flogbies, they look deepies, they look diabetes. Enough, this, this, and whatever. We don't understand Islam. We don't understand how the Prophet Muhammad Sassim reformed people. It is how the things. He even said that when you institute the punishment of Allah, you do it in an ahsan way. That is why he said when you slaughter, when you perform korban, you don't sharpen the knife in front of the sheep. Don't let them see it. You're going to kill the sheep twice. Look at the hikmah and the rahmah of the Prophet Muhammad <laughs> We all must realize that the freedom of speech principle is the one that shapes the intellectual character of society. When the Rasul was distributing once the booty that they had achieved, that after one of the battles, one of the munafiks got up and said he was now jealous because some of the Wa'adirun and got more of the booty. So he started criticizing the Rasul Sassim. And in, you know, you wouldn't dare criticize the Rasul Sassim in front of who? Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Umar wanted to get up, and what was he going to do? Huh? Chop off his head. The Prophet Sassim said, Ya Umar, be quiet. Allow him to say what he wants to say. This is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where does that leave me and you? There are three aspects to human freedom, my dear brothers and sisters. The, if, the issue of human freedom in Islam is number one. First is the notion that humans are born free as well as free from original sin. Understand that very clearly. Sometimes I hear some people say, you know, that you know, uh, I cannot suffer because in power of your mind it's for kid to do. Stop talking rubbish, please. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clearly in the Quran. No human being suffers the punishment of the sins of another human being. Understand it very clearly. That's Quran. Don't come with this nonsense talk. And nobody is born in sin. Nabi Adam and Sayyidina Hawa alayhi wa salatu wa salam were forgiven for the error by Allah. They were taught the dua, Rabbana dhalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna la nakoon anna min al -khasrin. Although the human descendants would have to live on this earth, it would serve, it would serve as a test of the faith in Allah. 
And remember my dear brothers and sisters, the more closer you get to Allah, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test you. Remember Allah says in the Quran, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسِ أَن يُدْرَقُوا أَن يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ He says, Allah says, O mankind, you say you believe in me. وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Prepare yourself for trials and tribulations and the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who was tested the most? was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Imagine, put yourselves in his situation, that the person that stood by him through thick and thin, he had to bury her hadithah radiallahu ta'ala. He stood in a grave and they handed over to him. Did he ever question Allah? He never questioned the might and the decree of Allah. Every time the only thing he said, Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiun. Secondly, given this test, my dear brothers and sisters, human beings are free to choose their actions. Allah has created humans such that they have an innate ability to know the difference between good and evil. No matter who or what we are, we know the difference between good and evil. And there is one aspect of shaitan that comes from his good name, you know, Iblis. There's a flip side of the word Iblis, and in Arabic text it is known as Yulabis. The word Yulabis means when we continue to do something which is wrong, in time to come, because we become so used to that wrong, it then looks like it is something that is right. So it turns the freedom of the mind, and it makes the mind think that that wrong that we are doing is something good which we are doing. And you look at a country like Arabia. We've got this idiot that's going to become the next king of Arabia. I don't like to use the word Saudi, I test it. Make no mistake. You can disagree with me, but I hate them with a passion. I'm sorry to say so. Do you know that Makkah and Medina is already in control of America? Do you know that? Don't be asleep. Understand it very clearly. You walk out of Makkah and what do you see? Do you see La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah? No. What do you see? Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken. You see McDonald's. Everything that has happened with Saudi Arabia is becoming westernized. And it's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he said, and by the way, it's an authentic hadith. You know, people will come up and say to me, Sheikh, you know, is the hadith sahih, blah, 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 whatever. The hadith states that remember the sa'a, the time of Qiyamah, the sa'a of Qiyamah is going to be when the clock of time is going to be higher than the Kaaba. And what is higher than the Kaaba in Makkah at this moment? Think about it, my dear brothers. You know what's even the worst part? I amaze myself. Some of the people that go to Makkah, why do you go to Makkah? You want to be in the haram, isn't it? Huh? The hotels are so posh nowadays, they create salah facilities. And all of these dumb dumbs, they say, you don't need to haram because the sheikh of Makkah said, the entire Makkah is haram, mashallah, so I can make salah here. Everything we wanted, you know, the, the choices that we make, we want everything easy, 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 no difficulty. And some of the worst complainants, when you go there for hajj, is we the South Africans. Complain about everything. The tears go, I said, it means only tears go, I said, I said, I said, You know what was amazing, my dear brothers? It stormed when I was there for Hajj. And when we got to Arafah, the carpets were wet. Hamda were the first of our group to be in the African, South African camp. So they gave us a, a dry carpet. Now you know underneath was still the wet carpet, so a little of those Small mosquitoes come in, they bother you. You know, sit here and this. And now many of the people I've got, they complain and moan. I said, you know, just be quiet. After Fajr, I took him out of the camp. And I took him, as we walked out of our camp, out of the gates. There were about almost 150 people from Gambia. And remember at that time, the sun is shining. At that time already, it is hot. But they were so thankful that Allah had granted them 
that that opportunity to be in Makkah for Hajj, they were sitting on hot muntah and they were making the care of Allah. And I said to my Muslim brothers from South Africa, look at their situation and look at our situation. <coughs> so the choices that we make of our appreciation to Allah is something we need to be very careful. And that is why we have the knowledge of knowing what is good and evil and have the freedom to choose good. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَنْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقَوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْرَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ تَسَّاهَا Allah says, consider the human self. It is formed and it is, Allah says, in accordance with what it was meant to be. How it was imbued with moral failings as well as with consciousness of purity. Truly, says Allah, to a happy state shall indeed he attain who causes himself to grow and purifies himself. And truly, who does not do so, he corrupts himself and is unsuccessful. <laughs> Choice is ours, my dear brothers. It's only by having this freedom that choosing to obey Allah becomes a meaningful process. Third, my dear brothers and sisters, will end of the inshallah. To be able to choose one's actions then implies that one has to deal with the consequences of them as well. Understand that vegetarian. I just want to give an example. There are Muslim males and females in our society. They claim to be Muslim, but they're getting married. He performs gay marriages. He performs lesbian marriages. And I met one of this, I was involved in one of his cases. At the end of the day, this girl said to me, I have the right to choose if I want to lead a lesbian life. That's it, mashallah. You can lead your life the way you want to. But remember, there is a consequence to your actions. And you're going to be accountable, you're going to be accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of us human beings are accountable to Allah on the day of Qiyamah. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُكِ وَنُخْرِجُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كِتَابَيْ يَلْقَاهُ مَنْشُورًا إِكَرَ كِتَابَكَ Every human being's dreams have been tied to his neck. And the day of Qiyamah, we shall bring forth for him a record which when he will find wide open and Allah will say read your book read your book and that is why my dear brothers and sisters we need to be very very careful just something very quickly I'm not going to talk about it one of the things we have not become free of is screen addiction you know what screen addiction? a simple question I ask you how many of you have put off your phones when you walk into this machine? No one. I don't have my phone on. When you walk into the house of Allah, you know Shaytan? When Allah said, I give you respite until the day of Qiyamah, Shaytan said to Allah, I will come from above them, from the bottom, from the side, from this way, that way, and inside them. And I will try to take them away from the remembrance of Allah. How many of you went to Makkah now recently? How many of you went to Makkah recently? What amazes me, people make the wife the phone rings. Huh? I put it down. One day I saw a guy making salah. Allah, his phone rings, he picks it up. He says, I know you don't worry about salah. You think I, it's, it's funny, but I genuinely saw this. Do you see how shaitan has enslaved us? Do you think we're really free? We need to start to really think how we are really free. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us freedom of thought and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the right freedom to make the right choices. Inshallah. <laughs>